Psalm 115. Not to us, O Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory. Because of your loving kindness, because of your truth, why should the nations say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. O Israel, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. You who fear Yahweh, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. Yahweh has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless the, uh, those who fear Yahweh, the small together with the great. May Yahweh give you increase and your children. May you be blessed of Yahweh, maker of heaven and earth. The heavens are the heavens of Yahweh. But the earth he has given to the sons of men. The dead do not praise Yahweh, nor do any go down into silence. But as for us... We will bless Yahweh from this time forth and forevermore. Praise Yahweh. This is what's known as a victory dance. This is a, uh, an end zone spiking of the ball for God's people. What, uh, what the author here does is he compares God and, and some of the attributes of the one true living God with some of the attributes of false gods, of idols. Now let me explain the ancient concept of idolatry. And I say ancient, this is actually uh, still the concept of, of idolatry in a lot of the world. You know, I go to India, they have shops where they sell gods and things like that, but they're just little statues. Well, how do they think about that? Is it, is it that they think that if, um, you know, if you break the statue that God has died? No, they don't see it that way. The, the idea of, in, in the Near East and the East, um, mostly, the idea of idolatry, of bowing down to an idol, a block of wood, the idea is this, that, that there is a God, a spiritual force who's in charge of stuff, uh, you know, and there's probably a lot of them, they're all polytheists, right? But there's one that you're going to pray to, and he's the one that makes the crops grow, or she's the one that makes the, you know, the river clean for fish, or I mean, whatever it is, right? So you're going to pray to uh, pray and sacrifice to this one particular God, and then to honor that God who exists in the spiritual realm, you make an idol in the physical realm, and that's supposed to be a, a welcoming place for this God to come be in your presence. And so if a Hindu has a household idol, and you, you, you know, grab it and throw it on the ground and say, ah, this is idolatry, and you break it, they're not going to say, you killed God! They're going to say, you have dishonored God by breaking his house, and now I've got to go buy another house for him. How dare you? You cost me money. Right? So they'll get mad, but it's not like a catastrophic thing. So what then is the Israelite psalmist doing when he says, oh, they have mouths, but they can't speak? Because from that perspective, it seems like, well, obviously they can't talk. We don't think this is the actual God, right? We think it's a representation that the God is using as a house. What he's doing here is he's saying, look, follow that through to its logical conclusion. See if it can defend itself. See if it can argue a case for itself. Right? See if this little statue of yours that you invest with so much spiritual power, there's so much in the cosmos that you say is, not, not the cosmos, the, the uh, supernatural realm beyond the cosmos, there's so much out there that you say is being housed in this little statue. In the end, it's like Isaiah 44 says, you're bowing down to a block of wood. And if you want to prove me wrong, go right ahead. See, our God, it says here, sits in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. Your God needs you to carve it a house or else it has no place to go. Right? Our God shows up when he wants to. Your God shows up when you put in enough work and skill and craftsmanship to give it a place to show up. Your God, your God can't even build himself a house. How's he going to build himself a world? Contrast that with our God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right? So he says here, you know, they, uh, he, he goes through this whole thing. They have, they have all these body parts, but they can't use any of them, right? Then, um, he says in verse 8, those who make them will become like them. Okay, so it's one thing to say it's offensive to God, the one true living God, Yahweh. It's offensive to him that you would think that spiritual power actually looks like this. You're aiming too low. He's transcendent. He's holy, right? 
get your eyes off of that. That's true, and that's fine. But then there's a warning associated with that, right? In other words, you become what you worship. Now, in the Christian way of seeing things, uh, you know, since Jesus came and, and gave us the Holy Spirit and the apostles explained all of this to us, we can say we become like what we worship, not because we become a God in some sense, or not because we share all of the attributes of Christ, but just because we are clothed in his nature. We are in Christ, and we're being conformed to the image of Christ. So when we worship Christ, God conforms us to his image. We become like that which we worship. Well, the reverse is true. If you're worshiping an idol, you eventually become like the idol. This is true on an ethical level, and it's true on a a biological level. Ethically, whoever, whatever your deity's ethical structure is, you're going to adopt it, right? That's why you'll notice a correlation in pagan cultures that don't frown upon dishonesty, right? There are a lot of them like this, where, where um, you know, shady business deals are just the norm. You're just doing what you got to do to provide for your family. You're not ripping somebody off. You're just participating in the marketplace, and it's a brutal place. Well, where does an idea like that come from, and how does it become pervasive in such a religious culture? Well, the answer is it's part of the religion because it's part of the character of the gods that they worship. They have become like what they worship. And so in the Christian world, and even before this, in you know, just Israelite religion in general before Jesus showed up, there were certain values, taking care of the poor, caring for the widows, right? Um, adopting the fatherless, not oppressing people who are helpless, things like that. Well, where do we get that from? We get that from our God, right? He taught us that because that's what he's like. And so you become like that which you worship on an ethical level. By the way, that's uh, just a, that should be like the best sales pitch ever for wanting to follow Christ. <laughs> you know, Would you rather be like Satan or would you rather be like Christ? Those are your two options. There you go. But it's also true on a biological level. Okay, If we follow Christ, we get the destiny of Christ, which is to walk out of the grave after our bodies die and to live eternal life. What he's saying here in verse 8, that those who follow them will become like them, or those who make them will become like them, in the end you're going to decompose. You know? You're going to decompose and you end up an enemy of God forever. I mean, we call that hell. From a Christian perspective now, since Jesus filled in a lot of the colors on this portrait of the afterlife for us, we know that eternal separation from God is not zero. It's not a ceasing of existence. It's not soul sleep. It's eternal conscious punishment. And that's the fate of the demons also, right? So we become like that which we worship, temporally in some small way and eternally to the extreme. But then after comparing Yahweh with the demon, the, the, the demon idols, right? And, and they are demons. I mean, that's what 1 Corinthians 10 says. If you sacrifice to idols, you're sacrificing to demons, right? You're screwing around with actual living evil beings. Don't do it. So he contrasts Yahweh with the demons. And then he says this in verse 16. The heavens are the heavens of Yahweh, okay, so God owns everything, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So, he's saying, the one true living God has made us responsible for some stuff, okay? Now, we're either going to take this stuff that we're responsible for and dedicate it back to Yahweh, or we're going to misuse it and mishandle it, and we're going to have to answer for that. So, life itself is stewardship. Think about that as you go about your Monday, because when we talk about stewardship usually, right, we're talking about money. Using the money that God has entrusted to us in a way that brings honor to God. That's kind of the Christian idea of stewardship. And that's, that's good as far as it goes. But money's not the only thing he's entrusted to us. He has entrusted the earth to us. And we have to go out there, out in that world, and swoop up a bunch of glory for God that he's currently not getting out of his creation. Right? That's the job. That's what we're doing here. So God, rather than letting us stay his enemies, has called us one by one and adopted us one by one to be his children. And that's good news, right? Beyond that, he did it at the highest possible cost to himself so that we would not become like the devil whose children we were before he saved us. And then once he did that, he gave us a job to do, which was to go out and use the earth for its intended purpose, which is to give glory to God. In other words, repurpose what has already been repurposed. We're going to take back what has been taken from its original context. We're going to redeem what has been stolen. God's creation belongs to him. The heavens belong to Yahweh. What does it say? The heavens are the heavens of Yahweh. But the earth belongs to us. We're going to make it the earth of Yahweh too. Let's go get it. Go tell somebody about Jesus this week. It's only Monday morning, man. you got all week ahead of you. Let's get it started. Let me know if we can help.